Good, thanks, Marianne. And thanks for the invite to come and talk to, uh, to you all. Um, I'll move on from the, the title here. You've read it already in the programme and it's quite worthy, but uh, I just wanted to point out that this microbiology is the department, or the School of Microbiology I teach within. I'll just contact details if anybody wants uh, information subsequently about the presentation. So I suppose like uh, Betty, it's just to kind of set the scene of how I came to, I suppose, be standing here today or to take on a master's or why do it or what are the things that interested me. And it's a kind of circuitous route, you know, you know the master's is something you do at the end. There's a lot of things happening in between that uh, orientate you towards that, I feel like. So I joined the microbiology department in about 2004 and I was, it was kind of a secondment position. So I was taking on curriculum that already existed and was delivering that. So that was there, but the teacher training, I had none of that. Uh, and I didn't know, you know I had done this for, for two years and I was wondering was what I was doing accurate? Was I accessing students? Was I uh, doing things right or wrong or whatnot? And I had no kind of framework to, to put on that. So I started to look at what might be available in accredited programs and I looked for something short, I suppose, uh, to access. And the Learning Technologies Unit at the time was uh, providing access to online courses and one of these was the Wide World uh, Harvard Graduate School Teaching for Understanding Framework. So I enrolled in this in 2006 and I started to experience for the first time for me, I suppose, a framework for pedagogy. Uh, I'm not going to explain it, people have, have maybe worked with this before, but it just is heavily reliant on performance and the idea of bringing in uh, students through their interest, what they call generative topics, and linking uh, elements together and then getting students to perform with their understanding. So it was very much about doing was what this was, was engaged in. And I subsequently stayed on with them for a few years. I became trained up as a coach with them and stayed on helping others with the framework. Uh, and it was very useful, but again, the first thing that I encountered. And as opposed to just experiencing this for myself, it began to feed back into departmental programs and we were asked to design a, a module, a kind of a flagship module really, for methods in microbiology. This was a very large unit. And uh, while previously I might have groaned at the prospect, Having the framework was extremely beneficial in this case and it allowed me to roll it out. This has become a, a module that students engage with very well uh, now. However, I was cognizant that it was only one framework, it was only one pedagogy that I looked at and there were other things really that I should engage with. And listening to other coaches online for this course, you'd hear them talking about the likes of um, Howard Gardner or Benjamin Bloom and all these names and I had no other framework for that. So I started to look then at other programs to, to kind of enhance my understanding of teaching and things that feed into it. And came back closer to home then uh, with, with uh, Marianne and Betty uh, and took on the postgraduate the certificate and diploma course over two years. And these exposed me to this teacher, uh, this teaching theory and methods of assessment and this kind of stuff when I, I started to get a bigger picture. And again, it wasn't just about me, it was about feeding back into the programs, looking at modules where there were problems, if you like, in engaging with students and taking parts of those theory that were relevant to fixing those problems insofar as I could. So again, it's very much a remediation strategy, try and fix some problem that I saw, but a short-term problem with a single module, perhaps. The exposure to the theory started me thinking about education, I suppose, in a general sense, and looking at students from a departmental program perspective, rather than just uh, single modules and whether or not they were getting something out of those. And I started to wonder, there was something I was looking at in final year students, and it was a poor, I suppose, oral performance was happening. Even though they were doing well academically in written examinations, when you gave them an unscripted oral exam, they didn't perform particularly well. And it didn't matter what their grade was to a certain extent. And this reflected, in my mind, a sort of departmental-wide issue rather than a specific module. So I began to wonder how I might take a look at that and, and assess what it meant. And this led really to the, the Masters, where I was moving from a remediation idea of fixing individual modules to looking at something on a broader base and seeing if there were generalised issues that would come out that might be acted on in the future somehow. So, I did jump straight into the Masters, unlike Betty, but balanced it out by taking about three years to do it. So, so what my interests began to become were kind of mass education in general, and I have a short few slides here on this, and what its purpose was, if you like, uh, really. And when you looked at reviews of mass education, or how it expanded globally, a lot of the things that were attributed to it, to the normalisation of societies, getting everybody on the same page, if you like, uh, to maybe not so much the cooperation for elite classes, but to meet utilitarian needs as societies develop and they're progressive and they want to grow, then they've got to educate their population to do so. But none of these things had anything to do with the individual or development of the individual, whereas today's standards are very much about the individual 
and they're reflected across all levels of administration as well, with teaching, learning, and the student experience being a big deal now. Which would make it seem like they're new ideas, but they're not. Not at all. If you go back through history, when at the same time that uh, education was expanding, there were those who were providing these voices about people being developed as individuals. And this is enshrined now in our human rights. Our basic human rights, uh, Article 26, states that education should be directed towards the full development of the human personality. So some of these people, and again, time doesn't allow me to go through them all, but Johann Pestalozzi is probably the four, founding father of elementary education, of primary teaching, and looked at this idea of, to echo actually what Betty might have said, the time to make connections, the time to give students a chance at mastery of a particular thing. And these are just presented in chronological. There are a lot of people you could mention, and any list will never cover them all. But it just follows on again this idea of performance within them, getting students to be interested in the material and develop this way. Up to more recent people, John Dewey, who started to challenge the idea of if you're going to put in experience in education, you've got to look at what that means. How are you going to assess it and, and look if it's being achieved? And those things are not self-evident. You've got to go in and investigate what experience means in your own educational settings. Moving towards, I suppose, the university side of things, um, Thorsten Veblen was an economist, a US economist, and has a, a popular enough book, I suppose, in 1918, The Theory of the Leisure Class. And he just looked at class structures in general across the globe and said that the leisure class, the upper classes, typically give themselves jobs that don't really contribute to society in any sort of meaningful way. They take on sort of benefactor roles, if you like, but society needs to work along underneath them. And he applied the same lens to universities and started to say that they've taken the view of providing knowledge rather than practical or experiential learning. And this is back in 1918. We're still arguing the same things. These voices, these messages are, are being reiterated right through history. And you've got to wonder sort of why. Uh, if there's a drive to deliver them, but the issue is, is can you? And then you go on down Sean, the idea of the reflective practitioner very much looking at how professional knowing is like and unlike the kind of academic learning and making the argument that universities are based on positivism, that we will do the experiments to find out the scientific law, let's say, and that's job done. We've generated the knowledge and, and that's enough. It's for someone else to decide how to teach people to use it and that kind of thing. So not quite that clear cut, but this is what they were imagining it came from. And then Ernest Boyer saying that you need to go back in and look at what you're doing. Uh, and these people, as I said, there's an exhaustive list out there, perhaps, but these are the people that were talking to me, and I was saying about my students, are they getting experience in learning? Are they developing practical capacities? And this issue that I saw with their oral performances made me worry that they weren't, and that this was a sort of departmental issue, I feel like, that needed to be addressed. So the question that popped up was, do these final year students develop professional capacities that could be assessed? There's a lot of thinking goes into how you decide to challenge that. I went for a problem-based, an action research, problem-based learning approach. I had a lot of experience with the TFU, but I felt the TFU was targeted towards extant curriculum. You apply the framework over the curriculum you want to deliver. Whereas problem-based learning, which has a strict criteria associated with a two and it's quite difficult to achieve, uh, looks at when you don't have curriculum and you want students to face a problem and develop curriculum thereafter. To do that, you need to be quite careful in the classroom about what you do. You need to set an appropriate challenge uh, here on this side. And what I asked these students to do is I cancelled the lectures and the rooms that we were traditionally in, and I used rooms like this. I told them they were going to act as consultant microbiologists for a company that wanted to bring a new fruit product to Europe, but that, that food product was going to be subject to testing for a microbiological contaminant. And they were going to have to come to the board and make a presentation about all the issues that would surround that, and economical issues as well as scientific, and their advice to the board, if you like, on how they should proceed in this setting. So they broke up into groups, uh, essentially afterwards, around certain topics within that, and then worked on their own, and we had kind of regular meetings, but it wasn't like a lecture scenario, if you like, it was all about them driving it forward. The other things to look for were risk assessment. You know, was the whole thing going terribly wrong? How do you monitor if it's successful or not, if students are engaged? So I used to videotape, being on the end of a videotape today is a bit more unsettling, but I used to videotape students and look back and see if they were engaged. And was I doing all the work or were they driving it forward? And then there was the monitoring feedback. How do you tell them they're going in the right direction? What do you watch out for? Uh, and how do you act without overstepping the mark of becoming the teacher and not the facilitator? 
And then, as, as Betty mentioned, the qualitative and quantitative argument is always there. This is outside our comfort zone as scientists. This is not the kind of work we traditionally do. And so it's difficult for us. There's a shift has to happen in us to be able to assess this kind of stuff and put meaning out. If I were to say progressive quality, quality is a very difficult thing to define. But in going from the first time that I did this to the end and looking at all these kind of qualitative things like student presentations, the documents that they had, the videos, the performances of both myself and the students, whether they acted as teams and whether they were really building and going somewhere with this. There was a definite shift between when I first started this towards the end of it in terms of quality improving and this line getting thicker here. And part of this was my own comfort with the PBL approach. And I started to have less and less of, a, I suppose, an, uh, an obvious role as this went on and just facilitated the students in, in arriving at this. Distance. If you wanted a number, I suppose, in 0910, I got 15 slides back from the students in their presentation. In 1213, they gave me 65 slides of a standard that I would challenge any academic to deliver if they were teaching the material in a similar fashion, in a, in a didactic sort of lecture scenario. So to me, it meant that they are capable of these professional things. And they gave presentations in this room at this lecture to the board, if you like, on these. And they were very competent. So they can deliver. People would ask about metrics and things like that. And as a scientist, you're always the comfort of numbers is there. But I looked at the exam questions and what they picked. And I would just say at the far figure there, the number of students who took the PBL question in the exam, they all started to take it. They became very comfortable with this material um, and demonstrated quite a capacity to deliver it in an exam when the question reflected a sort of a problem as well. In the exam, I made sure that the question reflected a different problem with the same information. So there was a contextual setting that was carried through that. Now, if they hadn't done well, so be it, and they, or they did do well, it's not enough for me to probably say that one outcome was beneficial and one wasn't. It doesn't say anything about how they were learning. And so at the same time, I gave them a survey that questioned all the ways that they engage with modules and their own learning styles and things like that. And I wanted to see if there was a more generic problem underneath it. So how am I doing there? A minute or two left? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, well, three minutes. Okay. So these are some of the findings from them. Again, there's a comfort as a scientist in numbers, but I asked them when they came in first why they picked this degree module. And most of them said they were interested in the material. So this was a personal driver to come into this program. Okay. I then asked them about how they learned. So the leaving cert before they come to third level education, and I asked them, do they use the same strategies in third level that they use in second level? None of them should say yes. There should be a zero here. And instead, about 40% of them reported that they were using the same rote learning strategies at fourth year in university. And this was caused to be quite an amount of concern, if I'm honest. I then asked them about how they learned their own, let's say, hobbies or personal interests and to compare this with academic, and they suggested a large overlap. So I then asked them, well, how do you learn in an academic setting? And they gave these numbers here of exam essays, just rewriting exam essays, rereading their notes and rewriting their notes were the thing that they gave a preference for. The idea of connectivity, of going between, so I suppose, integrated learning, going between disciplines and making connections between subjects, that didn't seem to arise at all. The use of peer group learning and this kind of stuff they weren't surfacing. So I was becoming quite concerned at this point. And then I thought, okay, well, look, they're doing something, but when are they doing it? And I looked at when they engage with modules. 57% of the students were only engaging at the very end of the module when the exam came around. Not even at the end of the module. They were leaving it going and then coming back when the exam came, or a strategy of both. Only 10% were accessing the material during modules. So they're not staying up with the course. In terms of learning outcomes, which we write down as the kind of guidelines for what's supposed to be happening here, they, again, there was this 73% of respondents mentioning that they only come back to these at the end of a module, and for the most part, they just use them to guide an exam strategy. They tried to interpret from the learning outcomes what the exam questions would be. At this point, I was quite depressed. I thought, is there anything that engages them that they get excited about? And then I finally started asking them about practical. There's just two slides on this. I asked them if practicals provided a more accessible route to learning. And 65% agreed. And I, I, the questionnaire that I sent them, I should say, had a variety of question styles. It wasn't just one yes or no thing. It allowed room for them to elaborate on certain things. But on this question, I asked them very clearly, do you agree? Do you agree strongly? Or you don't agree at all? And the majority of them agreed that practicals were, were more benefit. 
I then asked them what are the characteristics of standout learning. 40% said it involved peer work, even though this didn't surface in their strategies. And 60% said hands-on experience. And I wondered if they meant by hands-on experience that they actually had to physically handle something to be interested in it. So I asked them to pick out the modules that were the ones that engaged them the most. They picked uh, practicals as one, peer groups as 40%. They picked their research project, which they do in fourth year, as another one, and the TFU <coughs> module that I mentioned earlier was another major one where they were engaged. And 25% picked this PBL that they were just doing at this moment. So I asked them, how does PBL compare to lab practicals? And they said, 70%, it's as effective. 20% said it's more effective. So you don't need to be handling things in order for students to be learning. Okay. The hands-on experience in this sense is more to do with their performance. And probably the most important figure here is the last one, is the differences between PBL and a standard lecture. What are the things that are different from a lecture than the PBL approach? And they say active learning, 77% of them said, practical knowledge, understanding and peer communication. What they're telling me in that figure is the things they like in a, in a learning format and the things you should be putting in when you want to achieve student engagement. They will be engaged if the right characteristics are presented to them. So the conclusion is, as insofar as I can make them, is that PBL revealed a development of professional capabilities in response to a limited but effective intervention. If it doesn't matter. The intervention, in my mind, doesn't matter. It's that the characteristics of good learning are fostered, is what's important. I think a big issue going forward is can rote learning be challenged to the point of inadequacy? That's what universities need to do. They need to make it so that second level strategies can't really persist. And assessment may be a big target there for, for change. And also, educational objectives, learning outcomes and these kind of things are aspirational comments, largely. And you need to look at the relativities within each class setting to determine whether or not they really can be delivered at the level that you're pitching them at. Because okay? at the moment, students don't engage with them in that fashion at all, it seems. So I'd like to thank Mary. That's a summary of three years and 15 minutes, so uh, it's a bit rushed, but it's the best I can do.